The Gophers take on Drake May and the North Carolina Tar Heels, but they're not as scary as many people look at them, and I'm going to tell you why. Hey, you are no locked happens, on Golden Gophers. No matter what we're going to do here, we're just going to keep rowing. Your daily podcast on the Minnesota uh, Golden out, Gophers. Whatever turns out, we're just going to keep rowing. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We're just going to keep rowing, keep rowing, and keep rowing. You're listening to Locked On Golden Gophers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Kane Robb, host of the podcast, former collegiate football video coordinator and recruiting assistant here to talk Golden Gophers with you each and every day of the week, Monday through Friday. And we have another behind the enemy lines today. We're talking a whole lot of North Carolina Tower Heels. Now, this might be one of the most interesting matchups on the Gophers schedule this season. So we're diving in deep, but Gophers... Are going to be at media days this week. Big 10 media days jumps off today and tomorrow. The Gophers won't be featured until tomorrow. So we'll have more information for you on Friday's show on what we learned from PJ Fleck and the three players attending with him. But be sure to hit subscribe. Be sure to follow wherever you get your podcast so you don't miss out on the latest updates with the Gophers media days at Big 10 media days, along with our covering of every single opponent on the schedule today. We're kicking it off with North Carolina. Now, North Carolina is playing in college game day week one, and that is a fantastic thing for the Gophers potentially. Now, they're taking on South Carolina versus North Carolina in that week one matchup for college game day. It's on a neutral playing site in Charlotte, but it's Spencer Rattler versus Drake May, two top notch quarterbacks that have been highly rated as high school players are now going head to head. Both of them have some Heisman candidate odds. It's a big matchup and the matchup. In general, Gophers fans should root for the North Carolina Tar Heels. Now, people might be like, whoa, 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 what are we talking about here? We're going to play the Tar Heels. Exactly. That is exactly why you should be rooting for North Carolina, because it could play to the Gophers' favor in the long run. Now, as of now, UNC will likely be a team that is either in that back half of the top 25 or right on the cusp of being ranked by the national media. Now, with that, if you add in the major media coverage of them being a team that is highly looked at with Drake May as a Heisman candidate who are people are going to continue to buzz about, and then you talk about they're kicking off the season against another quarterback, another team that is highly talked about as being on the cusp or on the edge, you put that in front of a live a huge national audience, and you will have a lot of people falling in love with Drake May's game, a lot of media falling in love with talking about the Tar Heels, and that's okay. We're used to the Gophers being kind of seen as an afterthought in those regards, but if North Carolina and their Heisman caliber quarterback wins that matchup, the national media will likely put them in the rankings, which will continue to gas up the North Carolina Tar Heels team. And then they go to Appalachian State the next week, who did give them a run for their money last year. I believe it was a one-score game down to the wire. But this year, the game is in North Carolina in Chapel Hill as opposed to at App State like it was last year. So they're most likely going to get a dub on that one. So that likely puts North Carolina, if they win this game, at 2-0 playing the Gophers at home in Chapel Hill. Meanwhile, if, if the Gophers can knock out their first two wins – that could put this game on a very large stage with a lot of eyes on it, meaning both teams could potentially be undefeated, so that game would draw at least a good network coverage for it. On top of Minnesota would see a major boost on their resume and potentially put their name into a ranking conversation early if they can get a, min a win of that major game on the road. So getting into the conversation for the rankings could be very good for the Gophers. Not only if they can somehow sneak into the rankings right there with a win over North Carolina and starting off 3-0, put them at 24-25. If they get there, their next two games are very, very favorable for the Gophers versus Louisiana Lafayette and versus North Northwestern at Northwestern. So those are two extremely winnable games, games that should be stompings in the win column and you add that into helping the Gophers maybe 
tick up into the rankings a little further prior to playing Michigan in week six. And you're talking about a team that could maybe be on the cusp of the teens, maybe the 20 area as far as a ranking. And that would really help the Gophers boost up for that Michigan game. Maybe meaning whatever happens in that Michigan game wouldn't necessarily knock them out of the rankings. So that's why I would cheer for North Carolina because if North Carolina loses in that first game, all of this is for nothing. Not for nothing, but all of it, the rankings talk is for nothing because likely that means the Gophers would probably be placed even if they beat the North Carolina team and they lost to South Carolina. The, the Gophers would likely be on the cusp of ranking probably in that 30-ish spot in the country, and that's just not going to do it. That means you're going to have to go undefeated all the way through the Michigan game and pull an upset. Now, that would vault you into some rankings talks, but it likely doesn't put you in that respected media territory to get considered for rankings all the way up until the Michigan game in week six. And if you don't win that game, you have to go on and you have to beat Iowa. You have to beat Michigan State. You have to beat uh, Illinois. So that way you can start to get back into that conversation. It just brings the rankings talk way later in the season as opposed to early on potentially from week three with that North Carolina's win. So that's why you should be pulling for North Carolina in that college game day matchup. It isn't a pipe dream overall. We're going to talk about why North Carolina isn't as scary as a bunch of folks are making it. In fact, I like to think that North Carolina is about the same caliber opponent as an Iowa or as a Wisconsin. So you're definitely going to want to stick around and hear about what has changed with the North Carolina Tar Heels, as well as their potential strengths and weaknesses in a make or break in the 2023 season. First, we're going to talk about our friends over at LinkedIn Jobs. Now, have you ever been an owner of a small business or a company and it feels like every time you want to make a hire it's just stressful you have to put your posting on every website possible and you just feel like you're not getting enough results well those days are over because now you want to be a hundred percent certain that you can get the best qualified candidates available then you're going to post your job over at LinkedIn Jobs. Now, LinkedIn Jobs makes it super easy and free to create the post. Then you add your job in a purple hiring hashtag on your personal frame or your personal profile picture so others can see that you're hiring and they can pass along names as well. So your post is getting uh, qualified candidates, your network is helping you find qualified candidates, and it all adds up super quickly. Simple tools like screening questions make it easier for you to focus on the candidates with the right skills skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview with. All you have to do is go on over to linkedin.com slash locked on college and LinkedIn jobs will help you get qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Again, you post the job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college, all one word. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post about your jobs for free terms and conditions apply. All right, Gophers fans, so we're catching up with the North Carolina changes of the offseason. Thank you for making Locked On Golden Gophers your first listen when it comes to Gophers Daily Sports. We're tapped in, and we are talking about the Tar Heels, who are the Gophers' opponent in Week 3. Now, when you talk about the head coach, you already know Mac Brown is the head coach there. He's in his fourth season of his second stint with North Carolina. Prior to that, he was with Texas. So he is back. He's back in action. He has been getting that program back in shape, and they've get, been getting a lot more credit over those four course of the past four years with Sam Howell as their quarterback and now with Drake May as their quarterback. Back-to-back, back, it's kind of that pass off of passing of the baton with elite quarterbacks who have been in the Heisman conversation. And then you go to the offensive coordinator position. This is where the new is. This is where the changes have come because Phil Longo, who was the offensive coordinator last year, is headed to Minnesota rival, the Wisconsin Badgers. That's where he is. So North Carolina had to get someone new, and they went out and got Chip Lindsay. Uh, he Lindsay spent one year last year at UCF, which uh, he worked with. John Rise Plumley. He had a great season last year, his most productive season so far in his three years of playing college football. He was the offensive coordinator and quarterback coach, Lindsey was, and he guided 
that offense to a 26th ranked nationally in scoring with 34.4 points per game last season. They were also 11th in total offense with 480 yards per game. This is UCF we're talking about. They haven't been kicking in down the doors at all times, but Malzahn and Chip Lindsay made it happen last year. They got them scoring. They got them going, and they also rushed for over 200 yards more 200 or more yards in nine games in 2022. So they're not only doing it through the air with their quarterback, but they also can do it on the ground. He also showed magnificent success at Troy in the passing game, uh, 21st passing team in the nation with Troy. And then also in his first year with Troy, he had six games where he had over 500 yards uh, combined. So that's you're talking about 500 yards of total offense. Chip Lindsay can get it done. Now, will it work with North Carolina? That's yet to be determined, but he is a great hire to fill the shoes of Phil Longo. And then Gene Chizik is the defensive coordinator with the Tar Heels. Last year was his first season. This year is his second season. And last year it was rough, but we'll talk about the defense in just a moment. First, I want to talk about the impact transfers coming in for North Carolina. Now, North Carolina lost their top two receivers last year in Josh Downs, who was the second round pick last year for the Indianapolis. Colts, and then also uh, Antoine Green, who I believe either was an undrafted free agent or he went late in the draft. Can't remember off the top of my head, but both of them were the most productive receivers. Josh Downs was an all-conference receiver, I believe. He absolutely lit it up with Drake May. They had a connection. Both those guys are gone, and there isn't 100% clarity on who is going to be the guy to step up. Now, a lot of people are anticipating that Devontae Walker, a transfer from Kent State, will likely be the starter, along with another transfer from Georgia Tech, and Nate McCollum will play in the slot as a likely starter. That's two transfers coming in that you're expecting major things from right from the jump. On top of that, they've got a couple other impact transfers on the defensive side of the ball. Derek Allen from Georgia Tech, Armani Chapman from Virginia Tech, and Amari Gaynor from Florida State. Three impact players, as well as Willie Compton, an offensive lineman who is likely going to start for the Tar Heels. Now, all of these guys have production. They have experience. A lot of them have experience in the ACC. But will it fit the system? Will it play well against a Power 5 opponent? We're going to find out in Week 1 and then Week 3. North Carolina's got a tough schedule as well. So looking at the offense overall, you've got Drake May. Drake May is an absolute baller. He absolutely slings that thing. I believe he was over 200 yards in almost every single game he played last year. On top of that, he had multiple games of over 300 yards passing as well. He can throw it on the run. He can get it done scrambling. Um, He's not a, a stagnant quarterback. He's not a quarterback that's stuck in the pocket. There's a reason he has some Heisman candidacy to him, but it might be getting a little bit blown out of poor uh, portion, not not the talent that is there because he is uber talented, but the fact that he's the second best quarterback and he's second in Heisman rankings and he's the second in this and the second in that and Drake may, Drake may. Look, regardless of how talented your quarterback is, you still have to protect him and he still has to get the job done. Well, the defense here isn't that great and the offensive line isn't at either. So those are two things weighing against him. Now, they have three running backs that can get it done. None of them have cracked a 1,000 yards before, but none of them have really had the opportunity. You've got Omari and Hampton. You've got George Petaway, and you've got Elijah Green. All three of them bring different skill sets to the running back room. All three of them will likely see time, but I'm not sure what that will look like. Will they even get the opportunity to run the ball as much as they would like? Now, when you're looking at what the offensive coordinator Chip Lindsey did at UCF, we said that he had nine games with 200 more yard or more yards rushing the ball. So one that tells you not only will the running backs be involved in this offense, but if you look at John Rise Plumlee's season last year, he had quite a bit of rushing production on the ground as well. So Drake May will have the free will to do whatever is necessary. If he needs to get out on the run, if he needs to um, scramble out and throw it from outside the pocket, he'll have the green light. I think that's going to make him a difficult quarterback to get on the ground, but there is the opportunity to frazzle this offense. Now, 
like I said, we've talked about the receivers now. We've talked about the running backs and the quarterback. They have a nice tight end as well in Bryson Nesbitt, who had, I believe, five touchdowns and like 500 yards last year. So he is probably the most trusted weapon returning so far for Drake May. But there's a lot of question marks in those pass catchers. Now, they all have the ability to be big-time players, to put up big-time production, but they might not put up the production of a Josh Downs, a Josh Downs who was one of the best receivers in the country last year. So it's going to be tough to fill those shoes. Now you're looking at the offensive line, 80% of the returners or of the players from last year are returning on that offensive line. That's promising. That's something you like to see no matter what type of program you are, no matter how they did last year. But speaking of how they did last year, it wasn't phenomenal. It wasn't amazing. Uh, Willie Lampkin transfers in. He should likely be a starter, and he did decent last year. But the group overall lost their highest-rated offensive lineman, who was in the 60s as a PFF grade. I believe he was like a 62 in Asim Richards. Now, he is with the Cowboys, and he is no longer with North Carolina. And then William Barnes, who was the left tackle last year, he'll be back. He's left tackle again, but he is the highest-returning starter that is graded on PFF, and his PFF grade is a 58.1 overall. So nothing to freak out about. Nothing to be like, whoa, this guy is next level. He is that guy. No, the offensive line has a lot of question marks still, and can they protect this quarterback that is basically the entire offense, this quarterback that makes everything go, That this quarterback that has them in the conversation when it comes to being ranked, when it comes to being on the cusp. Drake May is the reason all of that is happening. So if the parts around him aren't happening, aren't clicking, aren't doing what they're supposed to, this North Carolina game won't be as scary as people are making it out to be. Then you flip to the other side of ball, and man, oh man, the defense – the defense wasn't just bad last year. They were horrible. They were 116th in the nation in total defense, worse than every single Big Ten team in the entire conference. The closest was Michigan State with 101st in total defense. I said North Carolina was 116th in total defense. So that alone is pitiful. Then you move over to the passing defense. They were the 116th ranked passing defense in the entire nation. You move over to rushing. They were the 86th in rushing defense. That's the only category I'm going to list here that cracked the top 100. Then you move over to scoring defense. They were 102nd in the nation. And you move over to turnovers gained. They were 105th in the nation. So they weren't stopping the run. They weren't stopping the pass. They were giving up total yards all over the field. They couldn't, they couldn't stop people from scoring. They let a ton of points go, and they couldn't get turnovers. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel a lot better as a Gophers fan knowing there's question marks on this offense, but we've got a lot of depth in the receiver room. We've got a highly talented quarterback who is back and ready to take on his first real year of experience as a starter. And we've got some capable running backs in that room as well. Plus, you got possibly one of the best tight ends in the entire nation. I would say top three, and there is no doubt about it. So you're talking about we still have the weapons. We still need to prove that the offense is there, but this defense is definitely a proving ground. So how can that defense approve in the area in 2023? That is a major ask. You, not, you don't need just a bump up for improvement. You need a leap, a jump, a hop, skip, jump, and everything more. So you're talking about a defense that has three four-star defensive linemen coming into this upcoming class in Joel Sterling's J. Bron Harvey and Tyler Thomas. That could help, but it's hard to get freshmen immediately contributing from the jump, especially on the defensive line position. Need to usually build up their strength, need to build up their insights, their playbook knowledge, their awareness. But you know what? They likely need some immediate production if they want this defense to massively improve. So you might see one or two of them, probably one at the most try to get involved and try to get more opportunities if they are able to. They're not going to just throw them to the wind. But also you need either star talent from your young guys like I've named or from previous classes, they need to make a leap or your transfers need to help you out. Now, like I said, the transfers, they bring in some needed experience. They bring in some experience from the ACC itself. Derek Allen 
He is a safety. He had a 61.3 PFF grade. He was a stud tackler with 29 tackles last year. Again, 29 doesn't sound massive, but he wasn't missing opportunities. Anytime there was a tackle to wrap up, he was doing it with an 88.3 tackle grade on PFF. Now that's rock solid. But again, 29 tackles isn't anything amazing. He was definitely uh, playing spot snap opportunities. He wasn't the full-time starter. Then you go over to Ar Armani Chapman, who was in a similar boat at the cornerback position with a 63.1 PFF grade. So they've got two guys that are decent. They've showed some signs. They've held their own, but they aren't next-level game changers. The prize transfer on defense is absolutely Ar 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 Amari Gaynor. I trip over his name every time. He's from FSU. Now, he only played five games last year because of an injury. He came in later in the season, but he graded out at an 82.5. He had six sacks in his career among the multiple years he played at Florida State, but he was a major player in each one of those years, putting up over 60 tackles in each of those seasons. Now, he played the linebacker, more of a linebacker position at FSU, but I think he's going to play a mixture of linebacker and edge rusher here with the North Carolina Tar Heels. So there's a lot to look at there when it comes to North Carolina. There's a lot of what ifs, especially on the defensive side of ball. And one name I didn't mention that I think has the talent to be a stud is Andre Green Jr., a wide receiver for North Carolina. But you still got Devontae Walker, Nate McCollum, and Chris Culliver, a true freshman coming in this class as well, who all could play as top talents in that wide receiver room if it clicks. That's the big if. So how... How will it all work out? They have the talent to improve defensively, but it's still a tall task overall. We're going to talk about potential strengths, potential weaknesses, and a make or break for this Tar Heels team in the 2023 season, and that is coming up next. All right, Gopher Stens, we're talking about the North Carolina Tar Heels in our game Week three game opponent, uh, the make or break for 2023 in the Tar Heels, in my opinion, is this team can be had, absolutely can be, and it comes down to limiting their scoring. If teams want to hang with the North Carolina Tar Heels, you have to limit their scoring. You can't let it get to a shootout, let it be a barn burner, or they showed last year, they're going to find a way to get that done. They're going to put up 57 points. They're going to put up 40 points a game and find a way to get the close ones. If you get in a shootout, your odds are a lot slimmer. But if you can limit their scoring, they showed that they can be had. Now that said, you still need to score on their struggling defense or you'll struggle to keep them out of the game. But that said, if you can limit their possessions and you can hold them 27 points or less, 27 or less, which is doable, they tend to struggle. Now in games that teams could hold them to 27 or less last year, their record was one and four. They won one of five games where they were held 27 points or less. The one that they did manage to win, they won by three points against Miami. Now Miami was trying to come back in that one. So they were down multiple scores and they came back into it and made it a three point game. But like I said, if you can hold them to 27 or less, they tend to lose those games. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds exactly like the style of football that P.J. Fleck likes to play. To have the longer possessions, limit the other team from having the ball, um, grinding out the clock, having your defense get off the field quickly, or giving that quarterback the ball as few as possible. That is exactly the style of football that P.J. Fleck tries to play every single week. You know it. I know it. Everyone in the state of Minnesota knows it. So that should play to the Gophers' favor against the North Carolina Tar Heels in this 2023 matchup. And it could bode well for Minnesota, but it is still a tall task regardless of if that is the preferred style of P.J. Fleck. Now, when it comes to the strengths of the Tar Heels, they have an omnipotent offense. They can score in a hurry. They can put a ton of points on the board. They often score 30 or more points. I believe they only didn't crack that... Uh, they didn't crack that 30 line in five games. Five games, they didn't crack the 30 line. Otherwise, they were above 30 points in every other game of the season. They've got another guy who can, or offensive coordinator, who can put up points. Like we said, in his time with UCF last year, they averaged 34.4 points per game. So right in that area that North Carolina wants to be in. So they've got an omnipotent offense with a quarterback can get it done. They've got three capable RBs who 
all could be a starting running back for their running back room. And then lastly, they have a ton of strong transfers that came in and have the talent to continue what we saw from last year. But the biggest question is, can they make an immediate impact or will it take time to gel? Now, when you flip to the weaknesses side for the North Carolina Tar Heels, there is no guarantee on the pass catchers. They 100% have the talent and the wide receivers and the tight ends that I've listed for you today could be the real deal, but nothing is guaranteed. And last year, they all a lot of North Carolina fans expected Andre Green Jr. to be the truth and jump in and be a huge playmaker maybe by midpoint in the season. I believe he played one game, one real game last year. Now, he played maybe a couple games and didn't get a lot of targets or anything, but I think he had one game where he actually registered receptions. Now, Antoine Green Jr., I think a lot of people had him on the fringe of like, yeah, he'll probably play a lot, but he might get phased out. No, he was the second highest productive receiver in the room. So it, it's all about can you click with the quarterback? Can you gel? Can you make it happen? And that is what isn't absolutely guaranteed. Now, especially when you're talking about at a level of a Josh Downs. So I think overall that could be a weakness is no guarantee in the pass catchers. But the biggest weekend weakness of all is definitely the many potential holes on the defense again. Now, some might have been addressed with that transfer portal, but this defense is a far, far way away from being a high caliber defense. Think about Michigan State two to three years ago where they were the worst passing defense in the entire country, the worst in the whole country. Now, last year, they made some significant improvements. But again, I told you in total defense, they were 101st in the entire nation last year. So that shows you it takes multiple years to fix a defense that bad. And that is the number one weakness of this North Carolina team. So if we can slow them down on the offense, I think the Gophers will have a good chance. And the Gophers defense has been a top 10 unit over the last two seasons. If they can crank that out here in year three and show some slow to Drake May, I think the Gophers are going to be absolutely in this game and able to potentially walk away with this one. That's going to do it for us here at Locked On Golden Gophers. I appreciate you listening. Be sure to hit subscribe. Be sure to tell your other Gophers friends about this. We're almost to 1,000 subscribers on YouTube, and we're not slowing down. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep talking about all the opponents, and then we're going to break down every single one of the depth chart in the position groups for the Golden Gophers. So I will see you then. Row the boat, Sky Yuma, go Gophers. And tomorrow we are talking Northwestern, and we're going to have someone from PFF on the show as well. I'll see you then. Row the boat, Sky Yuma, go Gophers. And as always, don't forget to subscribe.